All right. Good evening, folks, and uh, welcome to the May 2024 uh, meeting of the Davis Police Accountability Commission. Um, let's uh, go um, from, I guess, uh, starting from uh, Commissioner uh, Eskimo Greenwald for roll call. Mary present. <laughs> <laughs> Myself, uh, uh, Chair Horton present. Commissioner Sherman. Don. Yes, I'm here. Thank Commissioner you. Myers. Uh, present. All right. It looks like we uh, might be waiting on uh, Vice Chair Griswold to join us hopefully soon. And I think uh, Robert is, and there she is right now, uh, and I think uh, Robert is uh, unfortunately unavailable um, to join us this evening. Uh, does anyone want to make, oh, I guess that is not, uh, but uh, does anyone want to make a, a motion for approval of uh, this evening's agenda? So moved. I, I would like to raise a concern. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, I know that tonight the things we need to do is look at the charter and the surveillance. And I'm concerned that by the time we get to the facial recognition, it will be very late in the meeting. Oh. And I have a concern about that because last time we sort of moved over the surveillance pretty quick and it took us a lot of time on the other. So I don't exactly know how to bring up my concern. If, if we got to the facial recognition by eight o'clock, I don't have a big concern about moving through it. But if it's after, eight, you know, getting close to 830, I really have a concern because it's an important topic and I really want us to have time to really go over it and the information we've received and in the packet, it seems like there's a lot of stuff in there and I have real concerns about that. So I'm uncomfortable with the agenda as it is. I would like to make a friendly amendment giving, uh, given um Our fellow commissioners concern i'm looking at the agenda i would like to move that item up more i i don't know possible. that we can because the other things have to be done tonight you know the surveillance has to go to the council and i mean am i wrong kelly that they both need to be done tonight uh for surveillance technology any additional information you want uh, us to provide to the council you'd need to do tonight um, and this is your one opportunity to provide feedback on the um, the commission stuff. Um, there's, I mean, those are the only three items. So I think if we get started, then yeah, see how far we can get. I so I don't know if I say we bring up the objection at the time we get to it, or yeah, I mean, I, I think I just uh, that's my that's my concern. There's no. an awful lot of information in there, and I. I want us to cover the two things we need to cover well and not feel rushed so we can get to the other piece of it. Yeah, no, I hear you. Um, I think what you outlined kind of makes sense. You said, you know, if, if you know, if we are uh, post 8 p.m. and we're sort of just getting to that item, I, I, I think that, um, you know, we, we should have a conversation about what we're going to do with the rest of the agenda. I, I, I do, um, you know, I'm cognizant of the fact that we've had, you know, a number of discussions uh, for, you know, the past couple of months on on just that last issue, the FRT issue, um, um, and and so I'm 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 wanting to be able to move that forward. But Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong. Where there's not, you know, as opposed to so many of our other sibling commissions, there's not really substantively that much that the council is looking to do differently with regard to us, right? Correct. So. For the other, just if it helps for the other commissions where it's just really more of um, a conversation about the, the tweaks that the council is proposing or the subcommittee is proposing, it hasn't taken that long at those commissions. So what that's worth. Yeah. Like I said, if we get there by eight-ish, I'm okay. If we get later than that, because there seems to be a lot, I since there's no pressure to get this done, except internally, <laughs> um i i just want to bring that up as yeah a yeah let's yeah i think let's let's get into that when we when we get later on into the agenda okay. but I'm, I'm wary of, of extending this uh too much further um uh, uh, beyond that any uh, motion for approval of the agenda so moved uh is there a second <laughs> uh all those in favor of approving our agenda please say aye aye uh any opposed 
Uh, any abstentions? Motion passes. All right. Um, a brief announcements from staff. Kelly. I don't have any announcements. Uh, commissioner announcements. Um, I uh, traditionally, um, uh, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I just, um, and it's kind of generic, so I'm going to, there were uh, residents in South Davis who expressed concern about, um, and I did tell them to reach out to the police department when this happens. There have been um, some individuals downtown who have gone to their cars, knocked on their windows, pounded on their cars, and they just said they felt very uncomfortable and safe. And, um, you know, they don't have, I mean, other than sharing those stories, they don't have specifics, names, or so forth. But I did tell them to please reach out to the police department and to, you know, be safe. Don't engage in any confrontational, you know, discussion with them, but to please reach out to our police department and also that they can make a, an appointment with Mr. Michael Janako. So I just want to share that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I was just beginning to say, I, I generally, uh, at, in my announcements, uh, pay tribute to any of the, you know, uh, observances or heritage months. I'll, I'll very quickly, uh, in, in uh, awareness of our time, uh, recognize that uh, May is uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, Heritage Month. Uh, we, of course, have a, a strong history of uh, leadership and service, uh, you know, from Mariko Yamada to uh, Shelton Yip to, uh, you know, C Cindy Pickett uh, and Ruth Asmundson. Um, um, who've uh, led in this community, of course, uh, you know, 40, what is it, 41 years ago, um, we, we know that we had the the, the killing, uh, tragically, of a, a Tong uh, Hai Win um, in this community, sort of letting us know or highlighting uh, the, the tremendous uh, discrimination that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders can face in this community. Um, and it's important that, you know, C and I were at the APAPA reception uh, just a couple weekends ago, and we talked about, you know, uplifting the next generation of Asian American and Pacific Islander leaders, and I think that's a, you know, a critical thing at this time. Uh, May is also, as I take a breath, uh, May is also a Jewish American Heritage Month. Um, and of course, uh, we also have, you know, a, a great uh, or tremendous uh, history uh, in this community of uh, Jewish Davisites uh, leading and serving uh, in this community, including uh, in our very own uh, Commissioner Don Sherman, um, who's uh, been uh, the the uh, one of the longest serving <laughs> members of our commission, uh, including uh, being in the in the public comment gallery, I think, for our first year. Um, but, um, you know, and obviously we're, we're in a climate, you know, of, of over the past decade where um, anti-Semitism has been on uh, the rise. And, you know, I, I think um, it's important that we uh, reaffirm um, that conflating Jewish people and any uh, state uh, government um, is, is, is not a right thing to do, uh, including the government of Israel. Um, and it's also important to reaffirm that Jewish people in this community and around the world broadly have a have a right to be able to, you know, exist um, in peace in their communities. Lastly, I, I wanted to recognize that it's uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. And, you know, as all of us uh, certainly on this panel are aware and folks probably in the audience, there's a, a direct intersection um, with uh, accessible, uh, comprehensive mental health services and a true sustainable public safety in our community. And I know I speak probably for our, our full panel here, that we're going to continue to advocate for that expanded, uh, accessible, um, and comprehensive mental health services. Anyway, end of my <laughs> uh, commissioner announcements. Uh, as our council liaison has just walked in, any council liaison announcements? <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, public comment on non-agenda items. This is uh, the area where you would give us comment if you are not planning on talking to us about any of our agendized items like uh, facial recognition or anything else. Um, any uh, public comment on non-agenda items uh, for the commission today? Welcome. Hello. My name is Daniel Mojica. I am the external affairs chairperson at ASCCD and at UC Davis here to give brief public comment on the facial technology. Um, just doing that right now, just because I don't know if me and my commission are going to be there in time to give public comment at the appropriate time. But um, we just wanted to um, let you guys know of our concerns in regards to it. 
we think or we know facial technology can be extremely fallible, especially for individuals of color, um, including women, LGBT individuals. And so these false recognitions can lead to disproportionate harm that um, these marginalized communities are already face, right? And so we want to avoid perpetuating further oppression and, and the criminalization of these groups that already exist among them. The ACLU actually warns that facial recognition and other surveillance technologies are a threat to civil liberties and discourage people's free expressions. As students, you know, we are concerned about the potential widespread use of surveillance technologies um, against political dissidents and used to monitor protests. This will make individuals afraid of protesting and discourage social change, which is something that our student body is really known for. And with that, I would like to open it up to my commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the next commenter. Hello. Uh, good evening. My name is Anika, and I'm a UC Davis student, and I'm a member of the External Affairs Commission under ASUCD. I'm also concerned about the use of facial recognition technology and other forms of digital surveillance by law enforcement. I believe that the city of Davis should aim to increase its transparency on how they plan to use these new technologies while curbing its use altogether. Um, the use of facial recognition is far too invasive and violates the protections from the Fourth Amendment against unreasonable searches and seizures by the government. People have no reasonable way to opt out of facial recognition data collected on them by the police. Showing one's face in public is not should not be considered consent to this invasive widespread data collection. We would lose our anonymity in public spaces and as at any point in time, a mere photograph could re reveal anyone's identity and movements on a very large mass scale. This would inevitably lead to the chilling effect, where people are afraid of exercising even their legal rights and actions out of fear of potentially being associated with breaking the law or suspected for it. People would limit their freedoms and expressions to avoid this form of surveillance. This would discourage dissent and discussion and prevent people from protesting. Privacy allows people to engage in meaningful discussion, expression, and political participation without the fear of being spied on. People rely on the government to ensure security, but when the government intrudes on people's sense of being, it breeds contempt for the justice system. Individual autonomy is a vital part of security, and privacy rights will prevent the privacy rights prevent the government from intruding on people's sense of security. This would make the government no better than the security threats they claim to be safeguarding the public from. The Fourth Amendment does not only protect those accused of crimes, it gives people the right to be left alone. Thank you. Thank you. Was there, yeah, one more. Um... I'm very, thank you. I'm very concerned about how these small things can escalate into big things because once law enforcement has your information, they have it. And as a previous speaker says, you lose control over it. You have no control over it and you cannot opt out. In London, cameras are everywhere. It has not deterred their knife crimes. So it is very, very important that they really give it some thought about this issue with facial recognition, considering we have such a large student population here in the city. Thank you.
Thank you. And just uh, FYI for everyone, we will have a, a special public comment section for facial recognition technology a little bit later in the meeting, but um, we have a uh, open uh, line for any more general public comment, not on agenda items. All right, I'll go ahead and close public comment and bring it back to our consent calendar. Does anyone want to make a motion for the approval of our April 2024 minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Uh, any, I'm sorry, uh, any, well, any, dis any further discussion? Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? Any abstentions? All right, minutes approved. Um, all right, so here is the, um, as we previously uh, mentioned, uh, the uh, item regarding um, uh, the council's um, reorganization of committees. Uh, Kelly, did you have an opener for that? Yeah, let me just bring it up here on the screen so everybody can see it. Well, you can kind of see it. Okay. Um, so, uh, and I apologize. Um, Bapu Vaitla, who is one of the two members of the Council Subcommittee on Commissions, was going to be here this evening but was not feeling well. And so um, I am standing in for them. Um, I said I would be here anyway, so... Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so the we have a council subcommittee on commissions. It's um, Mayor Josh Chapman and Vice Mayor Bapu Vaila. They have spent um, quite a bit of time kind of taking a look at all of our commissions across the board and have made some recommendations to the full council for some structural changes. I mentioned those to you, I think, two meetings ago. Um, this commission does not have any recommendations for structural, structural changes, but one of the other things that the subcommittee is doing and bringing back to the full council, um, hopefully on May 21st, is a re recommendation for um, revising all of the authorizing resolutions, um, doing a couple of things in with that. One, they would have a standard or one re authorizing resolution that would cover kind of the, the structure and logistics, I would call it, of commissions. So how many members a commission has and uh, the requirements for the things that cut across all commissions. So nothing that's um, subject matter specific. And then each commission would have its own authorizing resolution, much as you have right now. Um, but it would really only focus on the actual roles and responsibilities of that commission. One of their goals and objectives has been to try to make that as clean, crisp, and clear as possible. Um, and so trying to narrow down, um, really uh, encapsulate what the role of each commission is in just a couple of bullet points. Um, what we found, again, maybe not so much with this commission, but with some of our other commissions, is that there's some scope creep and we have things that overlap. And so if you are a member of the public and you have an issue that you want to come talk to somebody about at, a, at the city and you're looking at the list of commissions, you might not know which one to go to. Um, so trying to make it as clear as possible for folks who um, you maybe aren't in this room all that often. So uh, with all of that, said as a preface, uh, they are proposing for this particular commission, the purpose to be listed as provide community-based accountability for law enforcement in the city. That was as succinct as they could make your purpose. Um, and then they have three separate functions, which I'm not gonna read out loud, but they're on the, the screen for everybody to see. And they felt that those three things really uh, provided the, the umbrella or covered the spectrum of what the council wants this commission to do. Um, what they're asking for this evening is for any feedback or input you have. Um, we've gone to each commission with that same request. Some commissions have um, voted on things. Others have suggested some word changes. Others have just provided some general comments. There's no specific thing that is required. It's whatever you guys want. Um, and I think I would add one other thing, two other things, actually. Uh, the... Council um, has also talked about the general plan update and commission's role in terms of public engagement for the general plan update. So that is sort of separate and in addition to uh, the the uh, the changes that are suggested here. Um, and then the last thing is that they the subcommittee is also expecting or anticipating that each commission will have. Um, either kind of an annual work plan or other details that provide um, more specific things that that commission might be working on in a shorter time frame, things that are more specific than what you see 
um, with the, the functions here, given that those types of activities, you know, differ depending on what's going on in, in the commission's world. So that was as quick as I could make it. <laughs> so, um, Chairman Martin. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think that these, um, you know, the three areas that are outlined here are functions. I think they did a good job of outlining our functions. And I want to make sure that I want to, I'm curious to hear from other commissioners. Do you think our public outreach that we've done, that that falls within these three? I think it does, but I don't want to be biased. I want to see what others think, but I think this does a good job of summarizing our work and what we do. Yeah. I think that, that, that outreach that is, I think, item one of our authorizing resolution is covered, I think, at least in my reading in this third item under the functions. Um, uh, you know, I was I was concerned as I was reading that originally uh, that it was going to say serve as the lead commission regarding the city's uh, community engagement component for police or policing, uh, which is not our job. You know, uh, we're not the, the outreach uh, unit for the police department. Um, I, so I think this, as you were saying, does capture um, as almost a, a very broad, you know, thousand foot uh, uh view of our 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 mission or thesis statement um did, was there other um I, just the one uh, thing that i want to add and it's not really an item for this uh it's more of a um sort of a conversation for the authorizing uh resolution uh review but you know i'm i've been concerned i'm concerned now as i have been since i was first appointed to this commission um that you know clearly outlining um our role in advising the council on police matters uh that meaning that we have to see it before the council does um i i i always want that to be kind of in, in firmly as in writing as it possibly can be and i uh, like i said i think that's a question for the authorizing resolution but i just want to bring it up now that we're having this sort of like i said these this statement conversation. Um, other comments from commission members on uh, this? Um... I guess that now that you bring it up, I, I agree with you on that because there's, I'm not seeing that particularly stated in here. I mean, I think the second item somewhat covers it, though very broadly. And like I said, at a thousand foot sort of viewpoint, um, it's it, it at least my reading of that second item suggests that 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 we are supposed to, you know, maybe it could be more clearly uh, stated by, you know, uh, make recommendations to who, <laughs> you know, make recommendations to the city count Davis City Council. It, that that might make it a little bit more apparent. Council Member Partita. Yes. No, but I mean, I... it doesn't talk about the surveillance which we're supposed to do every year and. I mean, yeah, but I, I think do you think that covers that. Right. Well, no, no, no. I, what I was going to say is I, I think that's a little bit more granularly going to be covered in, in the authorizing resolution. That's why I'm not as keen on getting into the, uh, you know, our advising role in the timeline at this point. I, I do think that that's very important. And I wanted to mention it now, but I think yeah. we'll, we'll be able to get into that in a more um, sort of structural way in the authorizing resolution. So I, I just wanted to I think I had a question also about the surveillance. Um, like where that fits in, but I think that that does fall under audits, possibly if, if that, I know it, it, it doesn't like really fit there, but I can see where if you stretched it a bit, it might fall under audits, but it doesn't really, um, the other piece of like making recommendations and, and like that, if I heard, um, Kelly uh, correctly, there is sort of a preamble to all of the authorizing resolutions that kind of are the same for all of the commissions that speak to the piece about making recommendations and that sort of thing. Is that is that correct, Kelly? So that's what the subcommittee is intending. Um, so yes, uh, the surveillance technology, I would consider that to be a police department policy. So it falls under that. If it's something that the commission feels you want to be called out specifically, that we can certainly take that back to the subcommittee. I'm happy to do that. Just to clarify that sort of preamble authorizing resolution, that's going to come to all of the commissions, just like this item is? No, the intent for that one would really be um, setting the the stage for how commissions operate. So, you know, you meet... Um, once a month, or you have seven members in an alternate, um, those those sorts of things. Meetings are generally in the evening, but it's up to the commissioners to determine a time, that, that sort of logistical stuff. 
I, I think maybe just for the reasons that, you know, we're just sort of brought up in discussion, it might be good. And, you know, if we have to resort to, you know, commission members just sort of showing up at public comment at council meetings, I think that can do. But I, I think it would be good to I, I'm sure some of our sibling commission colleagues would appreciate uh, getting some uh, an opportunity to share some feedback on on what they thought, particularly about the recommendation sort of process and timeline. Um, I, I know, you know, some of some of my friends on the tree commission, perhaps <laughs> would appreciate that opportunity. Um, anyway, so I just I just bring that up, like I said, as we're as, as we're setting the stage to the uh, authorizing resolution conversation. Yeah, okay. I I think it would be good to bring up to them that we're interested in having the language of uh, something to do with review and recommendations about um, surveillance and other issues identified as within, I, because we've talked about other things that we feel we'd like to see before. Yeah, no, I was particularly concerned, not to cut you off, but I was particularly concerned when, you know, uh, I think it was a sort of, of a growing pain of the commission being new, but the ARP, ARP process or the ARC, Armored Rescue Vehicle, um that's you mean the MRAP? Well the way well, hey, well we were told not to call it an MRAP because it's sorry. nicer and cuter than an MRAP. <laughs> anyway, it's a post MRAP yeah. discussion. But, but yeah, but that yeah, that that discussion about that vehicle and, and the city's acquisition of it, I you know, the, the commission was a little bit newer at the time and you know it sort of appeared very quickly on our council agenda without having appeared on a commission agenda. And I was very concerned as, as folks who were around at the time will remember hearing from me. Um and so to avoid something like that is what I want to do uh, in the future as as we're setting up these policies. Okay. Did you have something? Yeah, I, I'd actually be more comfortable in leaving it um, broader because then if we start naming things like, oh, surveillance or, oh, FRT or, oh, different things, it almost limits our scope. And then it becomes like, well, if it's not listed here, then maybe it doesn't fall under our functions. I think as written, to me, this makes perfect sense. The second one, review and make recommendations on policies, procedures, and training. To me, leaving it that, it covers almost everything we might want to do and then we have license to do that i mean if we wanted to insert the words review and make recommendations to city council on policy then that would clear that up but i think even leaving it as is is totally fine but the mrap isn't a policy procedure or training it's a purchase it would be a policy to make the purchase it's a, poli it's it's a, a procedure policy. Policy. i I don't know. I think we'll see how it's used. Well, I almost think like the fact that the commission was doing that in the past, like shows that whatever the wording was, it was already fine to be able to take that type of action. Well, we weren't doing it, so we didn't get to do it on that. So that's oh, what I he's thought, saying. Yeah. Okay. So I, I just, I guess mm -hmm. I, I could go with that, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. I think it would be a stretch on some of the things we're interested in looking at mm -hmm. to put it under a policy proceeding or training. Mm -hmm. right. Like it, like I said, I was saying before, in my mind, this is, I don't imagine it'll be this way on the document, but this is, you know, the, the sort of topic statement that goes on top of our authorizing resolution. And then we sort of get into the weeds of, okay, the surveillance technology, you know, review and when are we going to do it and how are we going to do that? Um, and some of those things that we can sort of spell out a little bit more in policy. Uh, I, I am really interested in, in this overall sort of preamble uh, um, uh, authorizing resolution that I think will sort of set up some of the overall process here. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm generally satisfied with this as if the idea is that this is a general thesis statement. Do you have something, Donna? Okay. I guess if the thought if you go back to the commission on doing this, if they're feeling that this would cover this and we wouldn't, if our request for something wouldn't be considered outside our scope, um, because what we're interested in is getting it before it goes to the council for a vote. And what's happened is more, we've at times gotten things after and I, don't know how exactly to state it, and I, I'm not wanting to be very specific, nitpicky kind of thing, but I want to make sure that that type of a concept is encapsulated in their understanding of what this means. Yeah, I, th I think that's critically important. And also, like I touched on before, I think part of the armored rescue vehicle sort of misalignment was that we were sort of new in the process of 
this commission existing <laughs> and interacting with the city council and the city government overall. And so I, I think we, we've gotten to a better place uh, since then on, on that kind of process. Um, I'm wondering if we, Kelly, in to um in the 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 document that's going to be attached to this, whether it's a resolution or some kind of a memo, state that this commission, if other commissioners feel the same, that this commission would like these issues brought before us first so that we could review it and make a recommendation or suggestions to council. So that is conveyed, what you're saying, Mary, so that that's conveyed to council. Can you? I might have a question oh. that, that might help us get there. Okay. Kelly or council member uh, Partita, is there like a idea from y'all as to a preferred spot in our sort of policy and procedures matrix to put what we're talking about? So I think the concept is, in, I mean, the concept is clear and I'm hearing it from three or four of you um, specifically to, and bring that back to the subcommittee and help them, you know, understand what, what you were talking about. Um, you know, at some level for any commission, it's uh, it, council, there may be certain things that council decides they want to take up first and that's their, their prerogative to do that. So I want to be, you know, transparent in saying that um, in terms of where this would, where this would fit in, um, I'd have to think about how best to put it in, but I I do think it is um, more of an, an overriding statement about how commissions operate and how they provide feedback to the council. And keep in mind too, that there are certain things that the council takes up and then they say, oh, we would like additional information on this. And they send it back or send it to an individual commission for um for weighing in on so you know, it, it you know it goes it's a it can be a two way street. So I, I so I, I'm what I'm hearing is that you can take that back to the council uh, committee and then and they can figure out how to pull a rabbit out of a hat some kind of way. Um, okay, um, other comments, uh, questions about this topic. I want to go to public comment. If not, no, I no. There's no action. I think that's recommended. Um, uh, public comment on this item. Any uh, folks in the public or in the audience wanting to address us on this topic? All right. Taking it back to the commission, any final comments or desires to take an action here? All right. Cool. We will move on to item or two part item seven, uh, beginning with item uh, seven, AR surveillance technology annual review. Of course, we uh, began this at the last meeting. Um, uh, skimming through some of the reports of the various uses of the, you know, uh, different technologies that DPD, really the city as a whole, but mostly DPD uh, utilizes um, that are part of uh, the things that are caught within the surveillance technology ordinance. Um, we wanted to come back and have the second opportunity for any um, additional things that folks had found in the report. Um, and I think there, I think do we still, we still have the, do we still have the committee on this. I guess we don't anymore. Oh, we do. Okay. Um, so yeah, any anything from our, I guess I'll go to our committee members first uh, that y'all have additionally. Um, oh, Commissioner Sherman. I'm picking out the um, Celebrite uni Universal Forensic Extraction Device. Um, that one is um, one that we've uh, spoken particularly about in the past when the, uh, when the, total package of surveillance uh, was under discussion. I don't know if you want to uh, hear from me on that at this point or somewhere down the line, but at some point within the context of this conversation, I do have some, uh, some research that I've done that I would like to present on that particular uh, device. Sure, I think this would be the time. Okay. Um, the use of the Celebrate Universal Forensic Extraction Device by law enforcement to extract data from mobile devices raises important Fifth Amendment questions regarding the right and self-incrimination. The Fifth Amendment protects individuals from being compelled to be a witness against themselves in criminal cases. 
there are competing perspectives on whether compelling a person to provide their device password or biometric access fingerprint or facial recognition, as the case may be, to allow data extraction using tools like Celebrate, whether this constitutes a Fifth Amendment violation. There are just two points to uh, support each idea, so it won't take me more than a minute or two more to go through them. Arguments that it violates the Fifth Amendment. One, providing the password or biometric access is considered a testimonial act as it requires the person to divulge the contents of their mind. The data extracted could potentially contain incriminating information, making the person a witness against themselves. Arguments that it does not violate the Fifth Amendment are basically the act of providing the password or biometric is considered a physical act, not a testimonial communication. The government, the second point being, the government is compelling access to information that already exists, not compelling the creation of new testimonial evidence. Now, uh, this is getting down to the weeds a bit as to the exact uh, language, and uh, we're not the Supreme Court, so we're not here to uh, evaluate this in terms of constitutionality. But I think the general issue uh, is one, if we look at this on a, as a practical day-to-day uh, -day, uh, tool, uh, I think we need to be concerned here. The Supreme Court has, I'm, I'm returning now to my research, the Supreme Court has not directly ruled on this issue in relation to modern mobile device data extraction methods. However, some lower court rulings have sided with law enforcement's ability to compel biometric access, treating it as a physical act akin to providing fingerprints or DNA samples. <clears throat> Ultimately, as technology evolves, courts will likely continue grappling with how to apply Fifth Amendment protections in the digital age. The outcome may depend on how courts view the testimonial value of passwords, biometrics, and the specific circumstances of each case. Uh, a personal note, I've always been particularly interested in the Fifth Amendment uh, ever since as an adolescent, I began looking at the Constitution. Um, the um, historical uh, color or or texture of the of the Fifth Amendment uh, is that um, the founders had experience, many of them firsthand, with a government that uses torture to extract so-called confessions from individuals. Now, obviously, this is not a strictly a historical anomaly. There are stories about this going on all over the world today. And unfortunately, even in the United States, the stories pop up here and there. And it is directly a matter of police um, accountability. However, uh, on the specific point of this device, uh, I wanted to lay out this, the pros and cons, if you will, that I, my research uh, revealed, which to me seemed to make sense, and particularly underscore that um, it, within the past 20 years, uh, the um, personal phone the um, what we call a smartphone because it's more than a telephone it's a computer and it's a storage device and it's something we use it for carrying our identification around paying our bills uh, you know take the phone out of our pocket 25 times a day minimum so I'll wrap it up quickly by saying I I am uh, sensitive uh, to this issue. People's lives are in their phone, and it would be almost impossible for the police to restrict their inspection of a phone to just the particular item that they may be, um, maybe have a, may be looking for. And perhaps the solution to this 
is to require a warrant uh, for the search of a phone uh, no less compelling than um, than than other more traditional warrants. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Sherman. And I, I, I see uh, <laughs> Commissioner Myers pulling his microphone down. I am interested in hearing, uh, if we're going to stay on this topic for a little bit, the uh, thoughts of our two attorneys on the uh, dais uh, on uh, what uh, Commissioner Sherman has presented to us. Well, Don, thoughtful, uh, as always, um, the Supreme Court has decided that the police have to have a warrant to search your cell phone, your laptop, your other electronic device. And, and uh, that's a fairly recent decision. I don't know the date, but you do have to have a search warrant to search a cell phone down. There is emerging law on the other issue you raised, which is really different than that, which is how can the police gain access to your electronic device? And that is an issue that is still developing in the case law regarding the use of a thumb. Can somebody be forced to put their thumb on their phone or their password or facial recognition technology uh, in phones? That's still an area of the law that's developing. But the Supreme Court has made it clear that except in exigent circumstances and lacking consent, uh, the police have to have a warrant to search your electronic device. Thank you. Anything further? Nothing. I, I, I would uh, question uh, the utility of, of that requirement. I'm sure that it applies in the vast majority of situations. But um, there was a case in our own area. I think it was, uh, don't hold me to this. I, I'm remembering that it was the uh, Yolo County Sheriff's Department, but it might have been a different agency, but it was in our neighborhood. And it was a case of uh, presenting, let's say the request for the phone, the request for consent to search the phone was made in a very intimidating way so that the average person, not a lawyer, uh, would find it very difficult uh, to decline that. Uh, so you probably have some experience along those lines, John. I'd be happy to hear it. Well, consent is the most frequently invoked exception to the warrant requirement. And you're right that it is an area that is ripe for abuse. Uh, but uh, we're not going to solve that in this commission. I guarantee you that. Other thoughts on this topic and others? And others? As called upon, I don't have further specific um, things to add on that. Obviously, Commissioner Myers is very knowledgeable about this, and um, you bring up some good points as well, Commissioner Sherman. Other uh, things that we have concerns or questions about regarding the uh, other technology items in this year's report? All quiet on the Western Front. Oh, no. <laughs> Were there not questions that came up last month? I, I, my answer, my question was, did they get answered? Because the minutes gave a lot of questions. Uh -huh. And I don't know if Kelly or Robert or somebody was going to bring back those answers or whether we just were moving on. So, well, um, so some all of those questions and your and your the entirety of your discussion from the last meeting that all goes forward to the council um, as part of the input from the commission. Um, if I, I don't have the questions in front of me, I did share them with the police chief so he does have them and could incorporate them into the report. Uh, I know there were questions about, for example, what the license plate technology reader sees, and you know, ours is set up so that it sees the license plate. I know you had asked for a, I believe you'd asked for like a screenshot or a printout of what it sees. Um, so I don't, I, I don't have those kinds of things for you this evening. Uh, and there was also a question I think would be about a, you know, a camera and does it really cost twelve thousand dollars? And yes, it does. Um, and there is a replacement fund for that. Um, there was a question about a current, and I'm not remembering what the question was at the moment. Let me get up. Um, oh, about the log. So that that will I don't have the answer, but that would be included in the the report back. So the report to council. Sorry, the report to council. Yes, thank right. you. Okay. Um other yes. 
I don't know if it's appropriate to do this, but I would move that we, um, as a commission, approve the police department, the, the chief's um, report and forward it to the city council. If that's our job, maybe I'm missing what our job is as it's written, as he's written it for us. I don't think we have an, I would correct me if I'm wrong, Kelly or anybody else, but I don't think we have an obligation to like affirm or accept the uh, report necessarily, but just to provide feedback or questions or recommendations for changes in policy if we feel like that's appropriate, right? It, it's up to you guys what you want to respond with, a, a motion or just general comments, um, your call really. Yeah, I think in past years we've we've, you know, had really no formal opinions and submitted a bunch of questions. I think that was how we handled the ver the very first surveillance technology review. Um, so yeah, we have we have a, a little bit of latitude here. But I, I think I maybe since what might have been. I think you said a motion. Um, I withdraw the motion. If that's what you've done in the past, I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Uh, other thoughts about how to uh, uh, recalling that we have to go to public comment before we. Uh, crystallize any sort of action, but any, any other thoughts about what we should do? I think there was also some discussion about the um, the grid that we get and how can we make it be more user-friendly and give us more information. And again, I don't know that that would hold up what we're doing tonight on what he had, but I don't know how we then move forward to because we've had this discussion in the past that um we'd like to see a little more specific specificity in some areas than we got less of the boiler boilerplate well yeah some of the 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 things so while i i don't have any problem with holding up you know what we got what we got but i i don't know where to move to see if we can get better information next time perhaps oh I'm, let's go ahead so i feel like we get some mixed messages on that we've heard make the chart simpler we've heard provide more information in the chart um if there is something specific that the commission does want it would be helpful to me to be able to communicate what that is rather than just it's not quite the way you want it right now but I'm not sure what you want. I think what I've, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I, uh, what I've heard from various uh, commission members and folks in the past is that there's a desire um, for, you know, we know that, you know, for there's a lot of investigation reasons why you can't get too deep into the detail, but a little bit more uh, meat on the bones in terms of how uh, the technology was used. You know, I think we we get, you know, hey, it was used five times used in pursuant to you know investigations um you know uh that that does that does tell us how many times it was used and what it was used for tech in the very technical sense but it 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 it, it um i think limits our ability as a uh uh non-sworn uh residency here in this community but particularly as members of this commission to render a judgment as to okay was that was that an appropriate set of uses uh this year well all, if all we really know is that they were used you know in pursuit of investigations we can't really make a judgment about that i think is at least uh, some of, of what i've heard over the years about the the what people would like to see can I ask a question? Um, sure, so, for example, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Okay. So, for example, what type of incident it was, or when you say more information, yeah, yeah, I think you know, it, what would do that? It might be dependent on on what the technology is, but you know, if we have uh, the uh, the accurate and the body worn cameras here on the screen, you know, um, uh. You know, it it was used in a you know a foot patrol. It was used in three foot patrol stops. It was used. In, I don't really know if that's a thing, you know, um, but it was used in uh, you know fifteen uh, uh, traffic stops. You know, um, it was used in 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 three incidents where we went to go break up a house party. You know, um, just sort of a, a little bit more information about what the what the use was. Yeah, Chairman Horn, um, I concur with you. I was thinking that yeah. Uh, we should give, get information on what it was used for, a little bit more specific instead of so general. And also, um, under recommendations, recommendation number two, hold a public hearing to consider the continued use of the care track system. I think in order to hold a public hearing uh, on whether or not to continue the use, we need to know how has it been used, 
in what instances, when was it used and what was the end result? Um, also with regards to license plate readers, I like to find out what or how many times they've used that and in what situations and if what the outcome was. Because if you do research on that, um, there are instances where people have been misidentified and there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I just want, this is good what they're saying, but we just need more information. Like, what is it used for? In, I mean, in what situations were these used for? And what was the outcome? So, so that we have that, that more detailed information. Other thoughts? About, yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know, and I don't know if any of us do. If you do, I'd like to hear it. Uh, as to what is what kind of record keeping the police department has about the how specific are their records about the use of these various uh, technologies? So if they don't if they don't have detailed reports, then I think that's an issue that they should have them. If they for their own needs. Uh, and certainly training, uh, and but to regulate them themselves, um, but also it's our business uh, to know that information. So I agree with my my colleagues who are suggesting that we be given uh, breakdowns, uh, and in some cases we're seeing in the re in the uh, application that the police are making. Uh, there are some things that they asked for before, but they haven't used, and maybe they haven't used it for two or three years, or maybe ever. And uh, since there is always some um, risk of misuse, violation of people's rights with any of these uh, devices, uh, the whole field of surveillance, uh, this is information that we really need to have that is both the positive and the negative if they use them we'd like to know exactly how and why they use them and and if they were helpful that would be very important to know how how were they helpful in whatever you know brief brief one or two sentence description of what the case was and and how it was helpful um and then and the and the other side of it would be uh just from a standpoint, not only of economy, but also of having things around that are dangerous. And uh, why take the risk of their being misused if you're not even using them? And so I think both of those questions ought to be dealt with, and they haven't really been previously as we've approached this year to year. I want to express a note of caution about asking for more and more and more and more detail. I don't know how many person hours it takes the police department to produce this document every year, but you can bet it's a lot. And the more we ask for them, the, the, granu the granularity of the detail we want, the more time it takes away from their ability to do what we hired them to do, which is keep this community safe. Uh, so I, I have very grave reservations about asking for greater and greater and greater detail, case numbers, facts of the case and so forth for us to do our job. I don't think we need it. I think it's uh, does it I think it just detracts from the police police department's ability to catch the bad guy. Just briefly on that, I, I do think, you know, we ha we have to be mindful of the staffing burden for lack of a better term of of this report and others and that 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 you know, I that jives with me <laughs> in terms of a a principle or a concept. Um I do think, you know, um there has to be a balance struck in, in terms of, you know, getting the information that we need to be able to do our job. And I, I do think, you know, while a good chunk of the information that we have uh, for uh, some of these bits of technology are, you know, really helpful in us sort of taking a look at at what, you know, what's going on and how it's being used. I think a little bit more is required for us to be able to do our job effectively. And so I, I, I'm, I'm cognizant of what you're mentioning, Commissioner Myers, in terms of, of being mindful of the staffing burden, but I, I, I think... I think we got to shoot for a little bit more than perhaps where we are in, in, in the information that we're asking for. 
Uh, yes, um, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Meyer's comments too, and we should be considerate of that. However, um, you know, this is the Police Accountability Commission, and we cannot hold the police accountable unless we have the necessary information to evaluate. So I do appreciate his uh, concerns, comments and concerns, um, but I think some of the information that we're requesting, we need in order to be able to do our job. Thank you. Um, I think there was a fair amount of information in here this time about the number of cases and what was used for. And I, I think for myself, as uh, Don was saying, you know, when there were things that haven't been used, I would appreciate more than just saying it wasn't used this year. I'd like to say, well, it wasn't used this year nor the two years before. This is how we would use it if it was necessary. So we get a little more in that box than just it wasn't used this year. Um, and not necessarily to say we don't need it, but I, it would be nice on that summary to sort of just get a capsule of what it is. We don't have to go back and look up what it says in the policy as to what it's used for and for how many years they maybe haven't used it. I think, you know, uh, that that's a, a very important point that I I agree with. You know, I think, um, um, you know, what the future <laughs> of, of some of these technologies are is also an important thing, particularly if we're not using them, uh, you know, this past year or for the past bunch of years. I We have a member of the uh, the senior commission uh, here with us uh, this evening and I'm, you know, uh, the care track. Um, uh, uh, system was brought up earlier, and we've getting we we received report after report <laughs> that no one is using uh, uh, the technology. Um, uh, this you know, despite it, you know it being helpful, um, uh, you know, for a lot of people's uh, personal circumstances. Um, you know, what what are we going to do? Are we going to shut that down? Are we going to try to you know figure out a different way to get that out to people who need it? I you know uh, anyway. Um, uh, but then that gives us toward the uh, are we asking for too much information sort of a, a situation? But I you know it, it's an it's it's some sort of uh, you know why and how long is is I think uh, helpful. Other um, have we done public comment on this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's let's do that. Uh, any public comment on this item? Um, if not, we go back to the commission. Any final comments um, on this? All right. Okay. Well, I, I would I would ask what what does the commission want to do about this? Is there is this an issue where um, we would like to ask uh, the council for um, for maybe for them to uh, instruct the police to keep to keep this information or to compile it for us? If we're talking about if we're talking about a uh, four or five items that we question and they haven't been used answering the question about that that um cecilia summarized uh it would be entirely appropriate and uh, where they have been used even more important uh that we have the details and otherwise uh, I, I completely endorse so uh, what my colleagues have been saying uh, we it is our obligation as a police accountability commission to know about these things and to keep track of them uh, on behalf of the public that this commission is expected to serve and on behalf of the council in terms of carrying out their wishes as to how these uh, items are being managed so I, I don't think we should be reluctant about that. I think we should be specific in uh, perhaps uh, passing a motion uh, tonight that uh, we would like more uh, record keeping on both the positives and the negatives uh, going forward. I think where we are, I'm not opposed to that, but I think where we are now is that Kelly uh, has been dutifully <laughs> taking notes about this conversation in our last one and is going to incorporate that in uh, what she sends to the chief and then what it, you know is ultimately before the council in not too long for their uh, own review of the surveillance technology from the past year. We we could, if, if we, I, like I said, I'm not opposed to us doing a motion, but I, I think what we've said in, in this conversation and in the last one um, uh, uh, will be captured in, in what's sent to the chief and to the council. I, I, I think that's my understanding. Um, 
Just a couple things I wanted to add when I'm looking at the, um, the listing for the remote public safety cameras, that one under the how used column, I think is a good example, um, for maybe what we're asking for the kind of level of detail where it's not case numbers. It's not the whole, like all the facts of each case, but it shows a bit more of, um, of the details of each time it was used. Um, it kind of starts off saying listing, uh, multiple crime investigations, burglage, carjacking, et cetera, a few notable cases. So you kind of just get a little bit more of an understanding of, of what it's used for and how, um, how they're using it. So I thought that was just sort of an example of more of this type of language, please might be kind of what we're asking for. Um, and then the other thing I was going to bring up, which this may be more of like a looking at these results over years, but if it keeps coming up that, um, well, like you were bringing up Commissioner Bliss, like, okay, is this thing like the robot or something not being used for years? And are there ongoing costs related to it? At what point does it become not an accountability issue that we need to address in terms of like rights being violated, but like an economic accountability issue of if some of these technologies are just not being utilized and the, you know, citizens are continuing to pay for them, that doesn't seem to make sense either. But we can't get that just from, you know, I think one year's data. But if we kind of looked at things over time, that might be another thing we want to approach. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Um, other other thoughts? So I, I just want to say that I uh, appreciate the conversation. The is, commission has been very thoughtful, and I really do appreciate all of the um, feedback that everybody has given and then um, I I would maybe advise that that sometimes it, it's helpful to step back and think about what it is that we're doing here. And what I think that we're asking for is for you to, you know, look at this from the lens of accountability and how these surveillance technologies could infringe upon, you know, people's um, privacy or are they being abused? What is the what is the uh, um, potential for abuse in them? And I think that you know year after year, if you notice that hey, you know we're using a whole lot of surveillance cameras, uh, then that would be something to sort of come back and question. Um, but I I know that you know every year these things come through and it's all very routine. So I I think what we would be helpful to look for are like patterns or or a change in a pattern, for instance. And what you mentioned about the the robot stuff, I don't know that that necessarily is something that is in the purview of what you're looking for. It's more of you know, what council would be looking for. I do know that there have been you know, instances where we didn't have a, a piece of equipment and people were, you know, we had to wait for it to come from somewhere else. And it was a tense situation, it would have been helpful to have that equipment uh, and people, you know, people's lives would have been saved. Uh, so I, you know, you have to sort of balance those, those things. Um, but I just, like I said, I really do appreciate all of the thought and, and I know that I'm going away thinking about some stuff. So that's, it's helpful. And when the when the notes come through and other and the rest of the council uh, reads through this, I think uh, that'll be helpful as well. But I do think that the suggestion about adding a few notable cases is, you know, is I think what people were looking for, especially on some of these where there's like, you know, it's been used a hundred times this year. Well, then give us a few notable cases for those for those hundred times that it was used. Um, any other questions, comments? Uh, I, I'm getting a thought that there might be uh, one of our folks in the in the public that might want to address us. I'll, I'll briefly, briefly open a, a public comment against no one. Um, welcome. Thank you, Chair Brian Hofer. Um, I'll speak in my capacity as chair of the Privacy Commission and co-author of your ordinance. Uh, your annual reports are not compliant. Uh, they're definitely lacking meat on the bone. And... Um, you know, we could have hours long conversation about uh, what other jurisdictions are doing, but I'll just be very briefly um, discuss a few items, you know, especially in the uh, subpart about information 
statistics about the equipment, uh, a self-serving statement that the equipment was useful or the data was shared. That doesn't prove anything. There's no efficacy there. There is a taxpayer component here. There is a civil liberties component here and your ordinance requires you to look at them uh, both. Uh, that's why financial costs ongoing and so forth are also there because as he said, if there's been no utility and you're spending money, why are you using it? Um, license plate readers, it's extremely easy. Click of a button to get the number of plates that have been scanned, the number of hits where there's been a match, uh, where most jurisdictions start to fail is going beyond that. Did you actually do anything? What was the disposition? I've built drop down boxes with certain jurisdictions, BART for one, $1,500. We just had to build a little text box, check it, what equipment did you use, what happened. So as, as people start to develop uh, systems, you can get more information. Nobody's doing it well today. Everybody has these growing problems, including Oakland. Um, Berkeley uses an Excel spreadsheet. We used the drone on this date. This is what we did with it. And then you just get a summary in the annual report. So there are some low cost, low budget ways uh, that you can get more information. But um, what you have in front of you is not not passing not a passing grade and uh secure justice we have a california audit of all the eight jurisdictions coming out probably in july uh, if you're on our social media or newsletter and i'll forward a copy to, to the chair um, but you can see what other jurisdictions are doing and how they're solving these uh, problems Thanks. thank you um final commentary here all right moving us into uh 7b continuation of the facial recognition uh technology discussion so uh, Kelly, can we bring up the the slides that were a part of the? Um, um, I just want to briefly go over. Uh, I hope folks got a chance to at least skim through this. Um, uh, if they took a look at our agenda packet, I almost thought they said Horton. I was like, there's an example. No, anyway, huh, that's Houston, um, uh, Kelly's neck of the woods. Um, but. Um, uh, Commissioner Sherman, you at the last meeting said, you know, hey, I, I don't feel like I have enough information. Uh, so this uh, this uh, slideshow was made up particularly with you in mind. And so I, I want to um, just, you know, be sure that we are, are walking through some of this. Yeah, we can go to the first set of examples. Um, and um, uh, and then we'll we'll sort of carry our discussion from there. Anyway, so in, in this uh, situation in, in Houston, not Horton, uh, as I uh, misread a second ago, um, uh, a person by the name of Harvey Eugene Murphy um, was accused and arrested of, of robbing thousands of dollars of merchandise from a sunglass hut uh, in the surrounding uh, Houston area. He was uh, he was in Sacramento, California at the time of the robbery. Uh, while in jail, he was um, unfortunately sexually assaulted. He did uh, have a criminal record. Um uh, but I, I believe that that's supposed to be has um, a, a new clean life. Um, um, you know, Jefferson Parish, um, which I assume is in Louisiana. OK, yes. Uh, Randall um, Reed uh, was arrested and held uh, for a week on a warrant issued uh, in Louisiana. Reed kept uh, stating how he had never been to Louisiana. Officers of the Jefferson Parish uh, Sheriff's Office used FRT to identify Reed. Uh, it was believed that he used uh, stolen cards to purchase fifteen thousand dollars worth of uh, designer purses. Um, I believe, you know, uh, when Brian was with us last month, uh, it was mentioned that in each of the cases, I think that has been documented across the country that folks have been misidentified um, uh, using FRT. I think a hundred percent of them uh, have been African American. Correct me if I'm wrong, anyone. Okay, yes, I'm sorry, all, all but but one person um, in, in the course of this time frame. And so these are just some of the the the, the instances, um, you know, you heard from some of them at past meetings. And so we just highlight some of these, I won't go through all of them. And but just this last, uh, this third one here in Detroit, uh, a person by the name of Portia Woodruff, um, police officer came came to Woodruff's home um, to arrest her for robbery and carjacking. She was eight months pregnant during the arrest and began having uh, pains uh, during uh, that uh, arrest. Um, she was released on a um, hundred thousand dollars bail at the time. She was uh, the sixth person to be incorrectly identified using FRT in Detroit. I think Evan perhaps mentioned uh, this case in public comment uh, a couple of months ago. Um, I won't go through the second set of um, of, of cases, but it, it's similar situations where in other jurisdictions, you know, you perhaps have heard me in past meetings say that accepting this technology into our community requires us to accept the certainty of wrongful detention for the possibility 
of a useful law enforcement tool for DPD. And I might sound like a maybe a painting with too broad of a brush sort of statement, but again, it's if you look at any jurisdiction that is utilizing this technology uh, in the context of law enforcement, that there isn't one. Um, where there has not been a, a number of cases of, of misidentification, almost exclusively um, of African-American individuals. Um, so let's maybe go uh, down to the next slide. Um, so, you know, um, this is a, a study that was conducted in, in the UK. Uh, perhaps the, the graphic there might be too small for some folks to see. But um, uh, the UK uh, Metropolitan Police in, in London um, out of 104 alerts uh, generated by FRT, only two resulted in positive match matches. I'm not a mathematician, but that sounds kind of low, right? Um, uh, uh, in in uh, the South Wales Police, FRT produced uh, correct matches in less than 10% of cases, raising concerns about its reliability. Uh, in that jurisdiction, uh, Oxford uh, Street in London, the FRT had been used uh, or exhibit, excuse me, its lowest accuracy rates when identifying uh, individuals uh, that were African-American, as stated before. Um, and then Latinx uh, individuals uh, were notably absent from this study, so making it kind of inconclusive with this data, um, how how that plays there um, in, in that UK example. Um, but you, you see over and over again this difficulty with FRT um, distinguishing uh, darker uh, skin tone ethnicities and also making... Uh, uh, correct assessments about gender. Um, uh, can we go down to the, um, I think that's effect. Oh yeah. Okay. Effectiveness and misidentification issues. Again, this just continues to go down in, in, in terms of the uh, data that we see in some of the other jurisdictions, New Orleans, I think, you know, commission colleagues will recall that I sent y'all a report. This kind of what really sort of sparked uh, my, my heightened concern about this technology, um, a, a study conducted in, in the New Orleans uh, police department uh, late last year, only three uh, potentially correct matches were identified through FRT usage over the course of a year, indicating low effect effectiveness. And this is not a jurisdiction that's only using this a couple of times, right? So there's a, there's a whole lot of uses and only three potentially correct cases. I, again, I won't go down uh, through the list of, of each of these. And I, I'm hoping folks had a, a chance to take a look at this uh, as the agenda was out over the weekend. Um, maybe just uh, uh, one more down. So, you know, um, I talked about at the very beginning of, of this uh, conversation, I know Brian is certainly uh, uh, aware of the other jurisdictions uh, who've uh, uh, gone in this direction, um, but so many uh, uh, communities with, uh, you know, similar dynamics as the city of Davis, as our community um, have looked at this issue, have examined their values, have examined what they want to prioritize in terms of uh, the integrity of their policing, um, and have decided to to ban the use of this technology for their their their, their community's law enforcement. Um, let's go down one more here. Um, so, uh, New York's uh, ban on FRT in schools follows an analysis uh, revealing greater risks associated with its use uh, than its benefits. Uh, it was originally implemented to prevent school shootings. Its efficacy has been questioned due to the higher false positive rates among marginalized groups. Again, as we previously previously discussed, excuse me. Rite Aid, I know this is a private sector uh, context, but this is, you know, it's not only government uh, and people who are elected and, you know, who are uh, funded by taxpayers who are taking a look at, hey, is this really uh, consistent with our values um, um, as an organization? Um, and so Rite Aid has, has taken a look at that too. And as I said, so many of these municipalities have done, uh, have, have decided to move in a different direction. Um, here, we just have a bunch of links to some of the, the various studies that were cited there. Um, uh, you know, and 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 then I, I guess is you know just below that is, is the draft ordinance, and I I, I get, do want to briefly um, summarize. You know, uh, y'all tasked us, <laughs> um, our commission colleagues uh, tasked us with uh, doing some edits uh, to this um, draft ordinance uh, at our last meeting. Um, uh, recalling <laughs> off the top of my head, I, I remember uh, there was, uh, and it's a shame Robert's not here, but he had some uh, some suggestions of editing the top two whereas statements, um, which uh, we did our best to incorporate, um, as you see here. Uh, I'm sorry, not top two, the the, the second and third whereas statement. Um, uh, uh, but one of the things I spent a whole lot of time um, uh, thinking about and trying to find examples for uh, was the thing that we discussed um, 
um, at the last meeting about uh, reconsidering or reevaluating uh, the efficacy of the ordinance in a certain amount of years. We talked about three, talked about five. Um, and so I do want to scroll uh, down to, uh, goodness, I'm forgetting what section it's in. Oh, yeah, right there. Yes, there it is. Um, so, um, so uh, you know, it's stated right here. I'll just read it. Uh, the Davis City Council, on the advice of the Police Accountability Commission and relevant staff, shall review the effectiveness and appropriateness of this ordinance every five years beginning uh, from its effective date. Uh, as we sort of <laughs> hemmed it hard and rolled over uh, the, that that concept that we talked about at our last meeting of, of considering uh, how well this worked uh, given the you know current state of the technology, whatever it happens to be at that time, um, and its consistency with our values uh, as a community um, just seemed like the best way to sort of capture. Um, I think I had been improperly using sunset sort of as a as a summarizing title, which maybe was not the most appropriate um, thing to call it. So here, you know, periodic review is what uh, it was called. Uh, it's entirely possible that when it meets the, the city attorney and city council that it's going to be called entirely something else. But um, I did want to draw attention to uh, those were the most substantive uh, edits from the last meeting, the, the whereas changes. Uh, and the addition of this uh, 0.20 item uh, periodic review. Um, let's see. Um, Y'all saw probably if you were uh, attentive to the um, uh, commission packet, maybe, I don't know if we were able to go down to the letter that was sent or the, yeah, the joint letter that was sent to us. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, there we go. Um, as you can see here, at least in the, the top uh, paragraph of um, a, a coalition of um, civil rights organizations, uh, privacy rights organizations, um, uh, wrote the, this email uh, that was sent to the commission. I know all of the folks up here uh, saw it, um, but uh, just in case you uh, didn't see it, uh, a copy of it is in the agenda packet online that's available. Um, Again, urging us to uh, to take this step forward in, in banning the use of facial recognition technology uh, in this community. Um, and then uh, I think as, as Kelly was just scrolling past a second ago, there was another memo that uh, Commissioner Myers uh, included um, in or, 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 or sent in to include in um, the agenda packet. Uh, I don't know if you want a chance to perhaps go over some of those points, uh, Commissioner Myers. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Chair Horton, you know my position on this. I think this ordinance is bad policy, would be bad policy, and I will vote against a motion to uh, forward it to the city commission. I'll just, um, my my document speaks for itself. You have your anecdotes. Uh, I have my anecdotes. Um, so in my document, which is on page 121, I'll just read two that are salient for me. Facial, rec facial recognition technology was used to identify the perpetrator of child sexual abuse that the perpetrator video recorded and intended to distribute on the dark web. FRT was used to identify that perpetrator of child sexual abuse. A criminal defense attorney used facial recognition technology to clear his client who was falsely accused of causing a fatal accident. Um, so there's anecdotes on both sides of this issue and I wanna um, be quick to mention that I think reasonable minds differ on this. Um, my opinion uh, for what it's worth is that this ordinance is poorly drafted and would constitute bad policy. It is a sledgehammer that would bar all use of facial recognition technology to solve a problem that requires a scalpel, not a sledgehammer. What this ordinance does, among other faults, in my judgment, is that it completely ignores the use and proper use of facial recognition technology to protect victims of crime. Our police department would not be permitted to use facial recognition technology to protect sexually exploited and sexually trafficked adults and children, uh, elders who might be abused or missing. Uh, so we are setting a dangerous precedent if this commission uh, recommends to the city council a complete ban on the use of facial recognition technology. I'm, if, if there's anybody who chooses his words carefully, it is our auditor, Mr. Uh, Giannaco. And uh, when he spoke to this commission at our last meeting, he said, and, and it's quoted here on page um, 
007 in the minutes, he said, there is a lot of nuance to this. And I think that's incredibly important. There's a lot of nuance in facial recognition technology. And this ordinance completely ignores the nuance and takes a one size fits all approach to this important technology, a technology which has downsides and upsides. But this ordinance with its complete ban on any use of facial recognition technology um, would perhaps eliminate some false positives, which would be a good thing, but it would also deprive our police department of the ability to identify some spec suspects who pose a danger to the community at the same time as it would eliminate, eliminate the ability of our police department to protect vulnerable victims of crime. So I will vote against the motion. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to briefly mention uh, two things. One thing that I forgot earlier and then one as a response. So um, uh, one, uh, I at the last, uh, or not the last, but one of the last city council meetings, I was here um, and Deputy Chief Henry um, was also here, um, to, I think, to update the council on the um, enhanced safety area for the picnic day um, event. And and so it, it was before the council meeting had started, so I had a, a brief chance to kind of check in with him on this particular topic. Um, and, um, you know, I confirm with him what I think, you know, most of the folks in this room know that this is a technology that's never been used by the Davis Police Department to this date. Um, and the department has uh, no near term or immediate plans to request uh, this technology, uh, you know, as, as as they would if they felt like they needed it. Um, and so I, you know, I, we, we've heard, you know, just now, and then also, um, you know, over the course of the past couple of months of this conversation that this is a, you know, we're, we're, we're we would be if passing, or if the city council passed uh, such a policy, you know, depriving the department of what would be a, a useful tool that's not consistent with what the, the, the deputy chief has said. It's also not consistent with what the, the chief of police has said when he was sitting at that very table, um, the last time we had him uh, come to this commission and, and I, I, I sort of trial ballooned him <laughs> on this topic, um, uh, you know, um, and, you know, so, so that's that. I had the chance to, to confirm that with Deputy Chief Henry, as we had previously heard from the chief of police uh, in this uh, in one of our previous meetings. Um, the second thing, you know, it's not my position uh, if, you know, in, in case that's been unclear, I don't think it's the position of anybody who supports this ordinance um, that there has never been a positive use of facial recognition technology in history. I, you know, that's 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 not my position. And I don't I don't think that's anyone's position who supports this ordinance. I think, um, as I've said before, it, it's it it seems in my in in my reading inconsistent with our community's values and inconsistent with a law enforcement system that has integrity to use something that we know on its face um, is not going to have equal applications to communities that have already been historically um, aggrieved by our criminal justice system. Um, so it's, 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 it's it, again, if I, if that's been unclear, I do want to clarify that it's not my position that there has never been a positive use of, of facial recognition technology. It's just the negative uses um, are so harmful um, to people in our community that I'm not, I'm personally not willing to let one person experience that in the city of Davis. Um, and I, I, I know that there are uh, at least a, a handful of folks who share that position. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that other thoughts on this. Thank you, uh, Chairman Horton. I um, I echo your thoughts and concerns. Um, it's never been used, uh, facial recognition. And I know there are those who have expressed concern and don't want it used. Um, do we want perpetrators, uh, people who harm children, sexually exploit them to be um, put away? Absolutely. And there's other tools that are used, um, but I'm not willing to say, okay, let's give up the um, safety, if you will, of black men in particular, people of color, um, non-conforming folks, members of LGBTQ, um, African-American women, women with darker skin. Let's give up their um safety 
to, you know, give up the safety of one group to protect another group. I, I don't think we need to do that because they have other resources to address those issues. I just don't feel comfortable. I don't, I don't want to look on the internet or on my phone somewhere and hear that my friend and Chairman Horton was stopped and identified with this facial recognition technology. It sounds absurd, but it has happened to people. It has happened to um, good folks, people who weren't in a particular place at a particular time. And um, they uh, unfortunately um, were victims of, of, of poor law enforcement decisions. So I don't feel comfortable with that. So I am going to support the um, either banning, if you will, or review of this every five years. I'm glad that Mary brought that up at our last meeting. Um, I think that's good, you know, to have it reviewed every five years. Who knows, maybe in five years, that'd be great technology. I don't know. But, but at this time, it's not something I can support to continue on. Thank you. I'm interested in the friendly uh, amendments that you've talked about, uh, John. Um, when you're talking in here, I see a mixture of both perpetrators and victims. And so I'm more interested in seeing about the victims and not using this to go to arrest someone, but I'm curious as to how you would state that. So you're interested in victims of pornography, sex trafficking, identifying perhaps a missing person. How could we do something and how would our police officers be able to use it within that framework rather than going after the perpetrators per se, but to help identify victims? Uh, thanks, Mary. I mean. First of all, I, I think I don't know the answer to that question, which is why in my little um, contribution here, I, what I caution us to do is not recommend to the city council um, an absolute ban, which would ban any use of facial recognition technology to protect victims, but rather to set this issue aside and study it in greater detail to try and come up with appropriate language um, there are states that are permitting this. About half of federal law enforcement agencies use facial recognition technology. There have to have been people out there a lot smarter than me who have come up with and thought about guidelines and protocols for these issues on the use of this for uh, victims of sex trafficking and sexual abuse. And I think, if anything, we ought to table this until we've looked into that. I'm not an expert on it, um, uh, but I'm, I mean, I would virtually guarantee that the FBI and Homeland Security and other federal law enforcement agencies that look at these issues that that deal with children, sex trafficking victims, have given it a lot of thought and have a lot more expertise than I ever will. And maybe we could get that information. We add that the city of Davis and DPD have existed for 170 years and have figured out ways of finding victims of uh, of sex trafficking and, and human trafficking without facial recognition technology. They've, they've figured it out thus far without the use of that technology. I mean, I don't know that. I don't know that there have not been cases of, of child pornography and stuff that haven't been solved because we couldn't find it out. No, not necessarily. I don't know. All right. So if we ask the, the chief of police, who we know is not a shy individual about sharing his opinions, hey, do you think we need this tool as we did a couple of months ago? And he doesn't take that as an opportunity to say, hey, there was that that child uh, trafficking case from a couple months ago that we couldn't catch because we didn't have this. He would again, that not shy chief that we have would have would have told us that that he needed it. And, and I, you know, not to. Um, not to uh, shortchange our, our deputy chief, who I know is also not shy, uh, if he had an opinion uh, that he wanted to share with us. And neither one of them have said that. Well, with respect, I would rather hear from them than your memory of what they said. The, the chief was right there. I, I, any of us who are members of this commission heard from him directly. Uh, so the, the the deputy chief, when that's you're hearing that from me, I, I'll grant you that. But the chief was, was right here. It's on YouTube right now if we want to uh, cross-reference that. Uh, I'm sorry. 
Thank you. Yes, I don't think it would be a good idea to um, sit on this and can kind of conduct our own DIY type of study. Um, I mean, I, I gain a lot of credence from these this letter that we've received from nine organizations that are, in my opinion, trusted serving the community type organizations that have done the research, have looked into this. The clients and communities that they're serving are um, some of those who are the most affected affected negatively by the facial recognition technology. And they, in no uncertain terms, are practically begging us to, to do this, to ban it in our community. And um, I put a lot of, of trust in, um, in these organizations that have looked into it, have done the research and um, to follow them. And even, I mean, even at the national level um, in this, um, these the documents that, that you submitted, Commissioner Myers, I mean, it is saying that only 20 of 42, so less than half of federal law enforcement agencies are using this. And some of the examples you're citing are on the other side, a criminal defense attorney, well, we're, we don't have any authority over them. So that doesn't really have anything to do with it. Um, or, I mean, these examples, I, I don't understand how these, again, with these examples of these shootings, which pull on people's heartstrings, but I don't know how FRT would have played any part in what happened at Sandy Hook or in Uvalde. Um, so it just kind of feels like it's um, different information kind of cobbled together. But when looking at studies that are specifically related to the harm done to marginalized people and communities, it seems so clear that as Councilman Partita was bringing us back to what is our focus, what are we called to do as a commission it's exactly this, is holding the police accountable on these issues of civil rights, racial injustice, um, people being um, overly surveilled. And so my vote is very clearly um, on banning FRT. Commissioner Sherman. Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn down the flame a little bit on uh, our emotional involvement in this which I understand and empathize with, and I share to a considerable de degree. Uh, I'm horrified at any case of uh, misidentification, any false charges that are brought against uh, innocent people. And the suffering is uh, immeasurable and uh, has to be of great concern uh, to all decent people. You don't have to be a police accountability commissioner uh, to be very concerned about any case of wrongful accusation. And yes, it is true. Uh, I don't think we, we could make an argument against, I don't think we need statistics. We know that the, um, the mistreatment of people uh, by government and and institutions generally based upon uh, religious and uh, racial uh, and gender preferences, uh, all kinds of prejudices that are very harmful in our society. But what we need to be looking at here is the harm that would be uh, that in the city of Davis, thinking about who we are, not necessarily looking out at um, cities and other countries where terrible things are done to people every minute, uh, but just think of our history here in Davis and the kind of people we have in our government, the kind of people we have in our police department uh, who would not advocate any procedures or policies or equipment uh, that would uh, increase uh, harm to marginalized groups. Also, um, th it is not the business of our government, and, or nor specifically our police department, to hurt people. It is to help and to uh, support, and, and uh, we've been moving strongly in that direction uh, during the years of this commission. So um, 
I looked at the letters. We've gotten a lot of mail, and we've had comments in last month's meeting and already tonight, and I'm sure there'll be more. Um, very strongly um, opposed uh, to um, FRT. I think many who are speaking to us and writing to us may be imagining a dystopian future with surveillance cameras recording the faces of everyone entering or traveling in Davis and then comparing those faces with some vast uncontrolled database of millions, even billions of faces randomly collected uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, that would probably make a good movie, but it is nowhere near reality. And uh, it is certainly not the intention of our police, nor any aspect of our government, uh, to uh, provide anything even approaching that. Uh, in real life, the use of facial recognition technology would be quite different from that. I can see it being used as an adjunct to, or instead of fingerprints, for example, which we all have believed probably most of our lives are the ultimate proof that someone was there to leave their fingerprint. Um, Apple has done a lot of research on this. Um, and um, they, 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 they have found that um, Efficient, efficient facial recognition, even in its present form, and it is it is very primitive at this point compared to what we expect in the future. But even at this point, uh, it is twenty times more accurate than fingerprints for identifying people. Um, it is one hundred times more accurate than eyewitness recognition, so called eyewitness recognition often introduced in the courtroom uh, and of course used by police and in case after case after case we've seen that they had the wrong person from fingerprints or from uh, personal from facial recognition human recognition uh, witnesses eyewitnesses and of course every time they uh, have uh, arrested the wrong person, even though that person suffers, or even if they're exonerated, there's been plenty of time for the real culprit to uh, make their way to Mexico or wherever they are headed, Saudi Arabia, wherever they have, they're going to hang out. Uh, so it's a, it's it's. I want to get away from the from the imagery and the and I think a lot of fiction that is in our minds. Uh, as to what could be going on as opposed to what would actually be going on, which is good police work and more accurate police work because it is their belief. If, I think we, we all believe that it is the intention of the Davis Police Department to get the right person, not just a person, uh, that, and, and be able to close the case. Um, so in real life, pictures and videos uh, mostly from security cameras, maybe from uh, body-worn cameras, are matched in seconds, fractions of a second, actually, with a database of persons with similar characteristics. I don't believe there's anything racist or prejudicial about that. I think it's detective work, police work, that we've always done and continue to be. Um, and I might throw in an observation here for what it's worth, and maybe we won't think much, but a lot of us carry around an idea or a feeling that um, minorities are persecuted by the police out of proportion to their uh, representation in the overall population. And it probably is true, and it's tragic, but the answer is not the problem is not facial recognition technology. The problem is that we have marginalized groups of people and taken from them the opportunities we assume for ourselves and for our children 
uh, to get to to live in safety, to have three meals a day, to have a roof over their head, to have two parents or at least one who cares about them and will sacrifice for them and do uh, all of these elements of life that uh, most of us are able to take for granted, but the marginalized people cannot take it for granted because it doesn't exist for them uh, to one extent uh, or not or another. And it's in the news every day. We can't get away from it. But it isn't facial recognition that is exacerbating these things. Actually, FRT is more accurate, more efficient, more economical way to eliminate false matches to diminish the extent to which marginalized people will be subjected to prosecution. Um, if, the, if the, two more quick points. If the facial recognition technology is as flawed as many of our citizens who've been good enough to share their thoughts with us seem to feel, then that technology will fail and will go out of business and will be gone. The technology business today is so huge and so competitive and so much imbued in every aspect of our lives that it is natural selection that we understand about the world, natural selection applied to things and gadgets and tools uh, that we use. If they don't work, they disappear immediately in favor of one that does work and that's going on all the time so facial recognition can only get better as with all technologies they can only get better because of the competition and when we talk about five years to look at this again five years is an eon in today's technolo technology think of where we were five years ago and think of where we are now in any of the tools that you use or any of the systems you're familiar with and of course, the changes are accelerating so that five years from now will be like 10 years of the past and it will be nothing like today. So it's far too long to wait if we're going to say we can't consider this in the meantime. I think what we need to do is, um, I think essentially what we should do is just put this on the shelf and do nothing. Um, we haven't been, as far as we know, the police department has not asked for this. Uh, we're not, uh, when they do, we can deal with it, with all of these ideas, all of our ideas in mind. Uh, but for now, I feel we should uh, just put it on the shelf and we can plan to come back and look for it at any time we want to. But I think one or two years from now, there'll be a very different a different set of anecdotes and a different set of experiences uh, than we have right now. And uh, in the meantime, we just, if, if it comes up and they're, they're planning to buy it. I'm I have a question consider. or a comment when you get a chance. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> yes. Um, Commissioner Sherman, thank you for your comments. Um, you did mention that, you know, law enforcement, we don't have, challenges with them here locally for the most part we don't but please remember that we have in the past which is why this commission was formed this that's the very reason this commission was formed picnic day can't remember the year that it was 2017 thank you when students were approached <laughs> that's not a good word but um inappropriately um detained i think is a good way to say it that's here that's just right down the street here where it happened and that's the reason this commission exists also it's been in the news all week uh, six former kentucky state corrections officers were sentenced for violating the civil rights of an inmate and obstruction of justice well let's bring it local just this past week there was a police officer that was let go here in Davis because he lied. He was involved with a either death or near death situation in Sacramento. And the Vanguard, the Davis Vanguard actually published that. And, and they um, had to let him go. He 
they did a background on him, but I guess he misused his name or twisted his name around like maybe middle name, first name, first name, middle name, something like that. Wasn't very honest. So that does happen. Thank goodness we do have some dedicated officers. We do that uh, do a good job of protecting uh, folks in the community and upholding, you know, upholding law and doing their job. But unfortunately, we've had some that haven't. I'm not willing to say, okay, let's go ahead with facial recognition technology. Yeah, let's visit it every five years. I think that's fair. I think that's very fair, more than fair. And as Chairman Horton mentioned, they don't have it in use right now, and they haven't asked for it. But, you know, they know how to ask for things if they need things. We voted down the um, MRAP, and uh, they came back later, said they wanted one, but a smaller one, because they heard the community say, we don't want this big military-style tank in town. So, you know, I they don't need it. They haven't said that they needed it. And I don't think we, you know, we could revisit. Five years goes by very quickly. Um, I I support this. Thank you, Chairman Horton. Yes, thank you. I have a lot of responses to the last little bit of discussion, but I we have some patient uh, folks who've been waiting to address us in public comments. So I'll go ahead and open public comment um, to anyone who wants us, who wants, excuse me, to address us on this item. You'd have three minutes uh, and... Whoever would want to go first can go first. If no one wants to go, we can <laughs> take it back to the commission, though I imagine that that is not the case. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. Brian Hofer, Executive Director of Secure Justice. Um, I don't know if you need to put this on tape delay. It's amazing that after 400 years of data to hear some of the statements I just heard about America, we might have a problem with racism. I've never put anybody in jail, but I know they're filled with black and brown bodies. How'd they get there? Top to bottom, California's racial stop data says we stop nothing but black people. Our laws are not applied equally to all people, yet every study done in human history says races commit crimes equally. We clearly have a problem with racism, and that's just one problem for facial recognition. It is one of the most powerful tools because of the infrastructure that's in place. There are cameras everywhere. The code is so cheap. You just flip the switch. You do live in a dystopian society. It's 2024. We're using facial recognition to identify Uyghurs in China to put them in concentration camps. It's 2024. Donald Trump is coming back, and we have been using facial recognition at the border to detain immigrants those lawfully seeking asylum, which has been a, a, a right for 150 years, at least in this country. I'm being nice. We cannot look at our technology and not saying it's helping accelerate the problems in our society. We cannot. You, you just you have no credibility if you're looking at it through that lens. Will the accuracy rate get better? Absolutely. That's not a good comforting thing because to make your sympathetic hypothetical about sex trafficking of children work, one, we have to have it on cameras everywhere. We've had a right to privacy to be uh, uh, anonymous in public since the founding of this country. It's one of the primary reasons we fought the American Revolution. So we take that away. How can you, your, your question was beautiful. How could such an exception work in practice? I'll tell you how. You all have to agree to be in, uh, to supply photos every single year to a criminal database. Why? I doubt you look the way you did at age six. <laughs> You're aging beautifully, ma'am, but I doubt I've gained weight. I've lost weight. I had blonde, I had blonde hair as a child. The only way for these, and that's every surveillance technology in the world, let's start with the children. We got to protect the children. It's a sympathetic use case. I get it. And there have been successes. I've sat in the same workshops with U.S. attorneys and had to go through this. What kind of society do you want to live in? Because the only way to find grandma missing in a crowd when she has dementia, to find the little six-year-old that now might be 18 years old that's been trafficked, is to have all of us be surveilled all the time, constantly updating the data. 
one, I don't even think it's practical. Your database would have to be so large for that exception to even work. The volume of people in Davis, the chair brought up a great point. You figured out how to solve these crimes without facial recognition. Your police department is not here advocating for it. Even if this was just a symbolic preemptive effort saying, you know, we don't think this tech is good. What's the harm? The police aren't asking for it. Um, I can tell you from all the jurisdictions I've reviewed, it's not a smashing success. We're going to, I think I alluded to a, a meeting ago, um, we're suing San Francisco for violating their ban. All the documents that have been provided to me from the whistleblowers, there's not one match, not one. So I urge you to go forward with this ban tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the next commenter. Hello. Um, my name is Shivi. I am uh, ASUCD's Deputy Legislative Director for Local Affairs, um, and I'm speaking on behalf of the o Office of External Affairs Vice President um, at ASUCD. Uh, we strongly object uh, to the use of facial recognition technology in general and by the Davis Police Department. While using this facial recognition technology in drones may initially seem like a good idea as it allows the police to observe situations without being present or instilling further fear through carrying weapons, the use of drones undermines the responsibility of actual police officers. The Marshall Project mentions that, quote, a Chula Vista police drone arrived in 84 seconds, and before officers could make it onto the scene, the operator used the drone video to determine that the gun was actually a cigarette lighter. If they'd rushed into that um, with limited information about the call and the officer spun around um, because, or not, not the officer, excuse me, the perpetrator spun around because he's scared of the cops and pointed the lighter at their general direction, we can see how easily how that could be a tragedy. Um, a department official told the San Diego uh, Union Tribune in 2020. And this scenario could be applied in the use of facial recognition where a police officer could misidentify a suspect and unfortunately shoot them based on an incorrect results from facial recognition technology. The question we asked, the question we ask as students is why are we training our police officers in a way that we inherently know that their presence will contribute to the escalation of violence and harm? In addition, I, I echo that facial recognition tech mis misidentifies people of color more than white people. I invite the commission to think of the analogy of using image recognition technology in detecting skin cancers. Even if the results are accurate, um, our, uh, as patients, we would like confirmation from doctors, blood testing, and thorough de deliberation. Um, and in both of these cases, using image uh, recognition, facial recognition technology does not bring the public any more security. I don't know about y'all, but I don't know how I'd, I, I would feel kind of, uh, I would feel conflicted if my doctor gave me my results based on um, AI detected technology. Um, but in both of these cases, um, it ends up providing more security for the police officers and the doctors. And I believe that goes against the very value of care and centers the situation around um, and, and doesn't center the situation around the victim. Ultimately, we stand by the notion that the human verification process is inherently valuable. Getting the fastest result is not necessarily the most efficient or beneficial for our community. And I urge the commission to consider what we are losing within a police force by virtue of implementing facial recognition technology and drones. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the next commenter. Just wanted to tie myself. Dean Johansson. Um, my wife, Nora, oh, excuse me. <laughs> my wife, Nora, wanted me to reiterate that story I mentioned last time about my previous wife, who, who was a nurse, and her fingerprint was misidentified. There were two identical fingerprints in the same hospital on the same shift at Women Hospital. So, but I wanted to go. Um, Brian made this comment about he's never put anyone in jail. I have. Before I worked as a prosecutor in two counties and a defense attorney in two counties, I worked as a computer nerd, basically, self-taught, um, running bulletin board services and programming databases. So I've paid attention for the last 30 years that I've been involved with law. And um, stats like 13% of the general population, roughly, 
are black. 40% of the prison population roughly are black. You don't have statistics like that without some form of prejudiced policing. The thing that we we um, ignore, keep an eye on my time, is that it's an adversarial system. My first job as a new prosecutor in Dinuba, um, Tulare County, I had a cop during the the actual jury trial tell me that the evidence was planted. Okay, it wasn't for me at the time. This seemed like something they wanted the person that was a driver. They pulled over a car and found a found a gun in the back seat under another person. They moved the gun. I was in the middle of trial. And what I'm trying to express here is that all prosecutors, and I have filed hundreds of cases, criminal cases against people, but all prosecutors know that they have to look further because officers think of themselves as on this team to put away bad guys. And this is the element that we're missing here. Um, here in, I'm gonna run out of time. <laughs> I can tell you all kinds of stories. What needs to be done, I think, is it would be wonderful. This will never actually practically be done, but Tracy Olson, the public defender here in YOLO, if she could have public defenders like I was here in YOLO for 14 years, actually tell you what the application of this technology um, results in. You would see, that's it. I know of one case on um, two years in jail and technology was not used properly. They had it and they didn't use it to exonerate. Him. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome to the next public commenter. Hi. So I'm Nora Oldwin. I've been here for 30 years, raised my kids here, worked as a public defender, not here, but in Solano County. But one of the things we're not looking at is the use of this technology outside the criminal justice system, like with the protesters. The woman that spoke made a very good point. Protesters right now, I believe it's in Columbia, are being doxxed. They're being, um, I think also in Berkeley, there, there were some protesters where um, their jobs are being um, kept from them they're being told they're not they shouldn't be hired the technology has two parts to it one it's efficacy but two the people that use it and how it's used and i'm so glad you brought up picnic day because i was nudging dean saying what about picnic day picnic day people are people okay technology may advance i don't think we've advanced much i don't think we're going to we may get smarter we may you know, hold ourselves in check by community. But that brings me to another point, which is what kind of community do we want to live in? And I'm going to just read you something my dad wrote back in 1966. The right to be let alone, Justice Brandeis wrote, is the most comprehensive of rights and the right most valued by civilized people. He wrote men. Justice Douglas added that the right to be left alone is indeed the beginning of all freedom. If we're constantly surveilled, we're going to start to implement uh, self um, what is it called? You you edit, you self-edit. Yeah, th that's not healthy. That's not anything we want, it doesn't seem to me in Davis. So I really just want to point out that it's not just the criminal justice system that we're looking at. It's our whole community. People protest, people do all sorts of things. And the use of facial recognition technology to have a consequence for some of those students, maybe. Maybe they lose their education. I don't know what was gonna happen. Awful things are happening at other campuses, but I'm just saying, if we don't need it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We are not asking for it. Let's not have it. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome to the next public commenter. Hello again, everyone. Uh, my name is Evan. I'm a student at UC Davis, and I just wanted to I'll be quick just to clarify a fact that we earlier mentioned. Um, someone said, I think it might have been Don, but I'm not entirely sure, uh, said that facial recognition technology is 20 times more accurate than fingerprinting. But that's um, slightly misleading because that figure refers to Apple's face ID compared to Apple's touch ID, uh, not against all like facial recognition technology systems. Uh, being used or deployed in like law enforcement and public settings. Um, additionally, I mean, 
we've all we've said this like a hundred times, but it misidentifies people from marginalized groups, which isn't facial facial recognition technology um, misidentifies people from marginalized groups, which isn't a problem with fingerprinting per se. So the comparison is uh, slightly, um, it's just a little misleading. Not intentionally, it just it, it's a little misleading. Um, and just that whatever whatever other um public commenter has said so far that I can remember, I just urge everyone to vote in favor of the ban. Thank you guys. Thank you. Um looks like that's our last public comment. Uh uh comments from commission members. Oh yes, go ahead. So I'll just summarize um and then be quiet. I, I think it is important for my fellow commissioners to know if they don't know it already, despite what a member of public said there is no right to anonymity in public he's just wrong about that there is no right to be anonymous in public supreme court's made that clear now if i respect anybody it's probably justices brandeis douglas marshall and ginsburg um and i don't know how they'd vote on this uh to be honest with you i suspect i might be on the losing side if i was in front of those four folks because they are the great defenders of our civil liberties. And I think we all have an interest in that. So I would leave you with this final thought. I would recommend that we not adopt this, that we do what Don said and put it on the shelf, at least until we can hear from our independent police auditor, because as I said, he chooses his words carefully, very carefully. But he's the one who said, there's a lot of nuance here. And this ordinance misses all the nuance. Well, let's take a closer look at it if we want to do anything, but I think we'd be we would serve our community and its values much better if we did nothing than if we adopted this sledgehammer approach to this problem. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I would offer just quickly in response that our our community's values are very strongly a pursuit of justice, and I, I can't. It's hard for me to see again this this technology being compatible with our community's uh, long reported values. Um, other comments? Oh, yes, go ahead. Well, with respect and affection, Dylan, I must remind you that um, we're we're not we're not we're not talking here about um, we don't have a police department and we don't have a city government that wants to go out and round up the wrong people uh, for uh, as suspects for criminal activity. Um, we're all on the same card as far, you know, on the same team as far as that goes. Yes, there are, there are abuses by police and they go on every day and all over the country and all over the world. And we, um, we have, we have had some incidents here, uh, the subject of the picnic day, um, event in 2017, which was the uh, the genesis of this commission and uh, much of the activity, other activity by our city council and our, and reforms within our police department. Uh, I, I, I see no connection whatsoever. Um, I don't know what kind of process was used to identify the people that were arrested, if that was what was in mind. Uh, it certainly was not uh, facial recognition in 2017. Um, the, um, and then, and then we, uh, we have the, the issue of the police department buying and hiding an armored vehicle. And um, <laughs> I can't even discuss that situation. I'm sure it's like a comic strip. But anyway, um, there again, um, the truth outed and it contributed to the reforms that we all agreed to, all parties agreed to. Uh, and I see again, no, no connection with facial recognition technology or anything that we had at the time to accomplish the same kind of thing. And, um, and then this case recently of hiring the person that wasn't qualified for the job. And uh, I'm very glad to see uh, David Greenwald's name come up and credit given to the Vanguard for the work he did on that. 
but I see no no connection, as admirable as it was and important. I see no connection between that and facial tech technology. I think we're all very, uh, we have a tendency to become very emotional about this. We've heard talk tonight about what goes on in China, as if to suggest that this commission would like to do things the way they do them in China. Um, I think the only reasonable, I, I, I have to agree with John, the only reason to me, the only reasonable solution to this uh, that, 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 doesn't box ourselves and put ourselves into some kind of a corner or make a commitment that we don't need to make is to not just do nothing tonight. Wait, wait to hear from Mike Janako, wait to hear from our own police chief. Um, and uh, meanwhile, keep our eye on this and there's no hurry. And uh, those of us who are interested can follow the technology and, uh, maybe get some more information and maybe maybe bring in a representative of uh, the people who make and uh, deploy this technology to tell us something about it, answer our questions. All of that could be done, but none of it can be done tonight. So I'm very much in favor of not passing any kind of resolution tonight. Yeah, just so just briefly, uh, one, I'm glad you brought up your your point about good intentions, because it, it gives me a reminder to that some of the thoughts that I had about that. I 100 percent agree with you, uh, Commissioner Sherman, that um, our police department and our city government are filled with people that have the best intentions for how they are going to serve um, the people of this community. Uh, but, I, you know, I think we would be hard pressed to find examples of or incidents of injustice that did not begin with the people involved having good intentions about how they were going to pursue justice and serve that community. Um, I'm sure if we talk to the officers who were involved, the uh, the officers who were involved with the uh, picnic day five incident, uh, they would tell us that they began that day and they began their career with DPD with the best of intentions of how they were going to serve the community and pursue justice. So I I, I agree with you in in the sense that um, uh, you know our, our officers and our our city government. Um, employees have good intentions, but I, it, historically those good intentions have not um, protected marginalized people from injustice. I, that's that's just what I would offer with with respect to the good intentions. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, uh, Commissioner Escamilla Greenwald, but I, I, I think there might have been some confusion as to why the picnic day incident was brought up in the first place. And I, again, I, correct me if I'm wrong in terms of why you brought this up, because I was actually going to bring it up myself too, in terms of, um, you know, Council Member Partita was earlier in our conversation, reorienting us to our purpose. Um, and if that was uh, what the intention was, I, I certainly agreed that, um, you know, the climate that uh, that incident took place in the community response, insisting on greater measures of accountability and justice here in Davis policing, um, that I feel like is the roadmap for us as a commission. And that is a, a body in this city that is more than anything else looking to protect um, those people who have been historically marginalized. Um, and we all, you know, I think we're all on the same page. I don't think anybody has a different position that African-American people and people of color in this community and more broadly have been um, aggressed, marginalized by policing. And so if we are all on the same page with, with that being um, something that is a historical fact that we stand against that this mission, I'm sorry, that this commission has a mission um, uh, to stand against in our city government. And then we also recognize this is a technology that harms those same groups of people. It's kind of hard for me to see how one plus one doesn't equal ban this harmful technology. I, I, I hear what you're saying, um, Don, about having uh, some reservations, but, you know, again, it, 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 it you know, uh, there, there's been uh, talk about, you know, let's look into this. Um, as uh, Vice Chair uh, Griswold was saying, these nine uh, civil rights organizations that many of us, I assume, trust uh, and believe in have looked into it. Uh, these are experts in civil rights, privacy rights, um, in criminal justice reform. They've taken a look at this and, you know, um, as Vice Chair Griswold has said, in no uncertain terms, have essentially begged us to pass uh, this draft ordinance. Um, and then just lastly, <clears throat> I, th I think I've heard um, Commissioner Sherman from you and then from uh, Commissioner Myers, let's hear from Mike, let's hear from the chief 
um, one, as I've said, perhaps at, at, at an elevated tone that was perhaps too elevated for this meeting, we have repeat, uh, we have at least once heard from the chief in this very room on this topic. Um, yes, we could hear from him more. He, we all know he can talk, so he can, can certainly talk more than he did at the last meeting about this topic. But I think we've we've heard what his judgment is about the the current term uh, need the department has uh, for this technology. It doesn't exist. Um, and also in terms of hearing from Mike, Mike has, with the exception of this meeting, has been at all of these meetings, has heard all these discussions, has weighed in at different times in this discussion to share his um, understanding of the current landscape with regard to uh, this policy and its use in other law enforcement jurisdictions in California that he's been involved with, observed in in terms of the the the, the progress of legislative policy in the state capitol. Um, so if, if people are looking to, to hear from Mike and the chief on this topic, I think in both cases we 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 have we have done that. Um, I just wanted to, yeah, go ahead. Into consideration, um, thoughts and suggestions by our fellow commissioners. Commissioner Bliss talked about, um, you know, revisiting this in five years, and we discussed that. And so we've discussed this ad nauseum. I think it's time to recognize that you know, the public has come to us saying that it's not something that they want. It's it's not our values here in Davis. And commissioners have shared that as well. So I I'm comfortable voting voting it down, voting to not have facial recognition. Thank you. And I would note just briefly that all of the in emails that we've received and public comment, we have not heard one person come to this podium or one person send us an email saying that they didn't think that we should pursue this. But Commissioner Bliss? Excuse me. <laughs> um, I, I don't think this is very well known out in the community, though, um, because I know I've spoken to some neighbors and people, and they're very surprised this is coming up. So uh, most of the people, while there's been some students groups, have not I mean, I'm just saying, I don't think this was wise. I guess I just want to make clear um, that we all, we're understanding that what we're doing is making a recommendation mm -hmm. to the com to the council. So we are not passing this. I just want to make clear, we're not passing this because we don't have the authority to pass it. We have the authority to say, we have this opinion on our commission these many are in favor of this, and this is why, and these many are against it, and this is why. And it's the council that will decide if they even want to bring it up. Well, I, I'm just wanting to be real clear that we're all on that same, we're not exactly, we're, okay. we're um, what we're doing is making a recommendation to create a policy like this or not, and why. Just want to make sure I got it right. <laughs> I would like to just, uh, with I have great respect for all of your opinions, and I and I appreciate where they come from. Um, every technology in, in the history of the world, every new technology has been greeted with disdain by some people, uh, very often a majority of the people. Uh, there were laws passed against, against automobiles in many towns and cities in the United States when they were new. Um, there were, and I won't go into to belabor the obvious, but the history of, of, of technology uh, through the life of man on earth has been uh, people have been slow to uh, be comfortable with it and to be uh, more comfortable with what they're used to and to fear the worst possible outcomes and to exaggerate uh, since out of sincerity and real concern. It isn't that they're trying to deceive anyone, but they really see the um, it's a natural thing. They can they can they can see the difficulties to being introduced by the new, and uh, they they they're they're afraid of it. Um, 
so again, we, we, I don't think any of us want the police to ever arrest the wrong person. I'm sure we all agree on that. We know that at, uh, with the best efforts, there will occasionally be the wrong person charged, but we want to diminish that. I don't find it difficult to envision facial recognition technology as it's developed and becomes more and more accurate uh, to be um, to be useful, to be positive in that regard, to save the innocent more than it would harm the innocent, to save the innocent from being uh, charged. Uh, because what the technology is designed to do is to make an accurate comparison uh, of of of, uh, of an image of of a person with with the actual person or with another image of the person, so um, we I'm, I'm sure we don't have to take a vote on that. So again, um, I, I I I frankly I can see if we were to pass the kind of resolution that most of you are advocating and that the speakers have been advocating and the letter writers have been advocating that we would be in the news for having done this. And people would say, really wonder why we were doing this and why we're doing this at this particular time. Why do we feel it is necessary when no one in our government, including the police department, has asked for it? Why go on record of opposing something that we are opposing out of a lack of experience, out of a lack of information, and knowing that we're dealing with something that is constantly changing and developing, and and uh, and, and uh, you know the the uh, the natural selection that that improves the technology as we go along. So. For those for those I mean, reasons, I I can't yeah I can't we're support it. we're approaching nine o'clock yeah we're approaching nine I would like to call the question. Okay, I would like to make a motion that we pass this resolution, and it is asking council again. It's a recommendation. That's what this is. It's a recommendation because we're only a an advisory body to council. Anything we pass to council is always advisory. We're not the elected officials of council like our liaison. <laughs> uh, that we recommend that council um, adopt this uh, resolution. Yeah. So it's a recommendation to council. Yes. Second. Uh, is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, aye. Uh, all those opposed? Aye. Uh, any abstentions? All right, motion passes. Um, let's see. Um, liaison, um, can we, um, can we remove, uh, the May stabbing, uh, subcommittee from future agendas? Okay. Yeah, because it's it's yeah, it would, the outreach subcommission, which committee, well, which has done nothing. But, from, from well, the, the, uh, so um, yeah, let's get into <laughs> into the outreach um discussion um, which includes uh, myself, Commissioner Sherman, and uh, uh, Commissioner Canning. Um, this is a committee uh to help us plan the uh what I assume will be the fall outreach um uh event um and so yeah, we have not met. Um, and we need to beat um, because we are very fast approaching fall. I um, <laughs> so uh, I think this needs to stay because we need to get the work done. Um, uh, appreciate folks who joined us this evening. Um, um, and so I, yeah, I would recommend that it stay on. We just need to, we just need to go ahead and meet. Um, um, yeah. And so other than that, there's no other report questions, comments on, on those two items. Uh, any public comment on those uh, two subcommittee updates? Uh, long range calendar. Anyone want to uh, make a bid to add something to a future agenda? Any public comment on uh, adding things to future agendas? Um, adjournment. Anyone want to make a motion for adjournment? So moved. Is there a second? 
Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone.